We are back. Senators, twins, baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and two of the three co-hosts are here today, and a guest, Ronnie Rabinovitz, and George Hi, Ralph. the third is here. Hi, George. Hi, gentlemen. Hey, guys. Um, Chad Rubin, recovering um, from an undisclosed uh, infection, and he's been hospitalized and will not be available today. So uh, we wish you best, the best, Chad, and um, Ronnie's going to pass on our best wishes in person to you later in the day. I sure um, will. Get well. Uh, Ronnie, um, I, I'm going to introduce our guest. He is a mainstay in the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. He has his own show called Genesis on the network. Um, he is a baseball historian, an attorney, a renaissance man, a bon voyant, <laughs> Ian Kahana the Wits. How, will, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing good. Thank you for letting me on the show, Ralph. And it's an honor to be with you and and the rest of the crew here. It's 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 definitely an honor, especially with Ronnie and uh, George Case the Third. Well, we're yeah, looking forward I, to it. Uh, Thank you, Ian. I've assembled uh, quite a, quite a crew on Sunday mornings. Um, the esteemed George Case the Third, whose dad. Um, Played with the Washington Senators, among other teams, and um, knew Calvin Griffith really well. And um, Ian is going to talk to us today about um, the early history of the Washington Senators. I want to know how the franchise got started, Ian, and um, maybe you can tell us, if you would. Well, basically, in uh, 1901, uh, the Washington Senators baseball team was one of the American League's eight charter franchises. When Ben Johnson was uh, moving from being a minor league, uh, you know, president of the Western League, he was trying to convert uh, to challenge the monopoly that the National League uh, had since 1876. And one of the places which was the hot spots was Washington, D.C. And in 1901, uh, the Senators were born. Now, the problem was, in 1905, the, che- the team changed its official name to the Washington Nationals. And the Nationals actually appeared on the uniform for only two seasons. And that was replaced with the famous W logo, which we would see in, for the next 52 years until 1960. Uh, the name Senators and Nationals, and of course, shorter for Nats, were used interchangeably by fans for the next 60 years. And so what we have today uh, in Washington is the Nationals. But back then, and I'm sure George could attest to this, because his father played for the team, it was used interchangeably. Uh, but, it, but its meaning was pretty much the same. It was in D.C. Now, of course, we know, uh, besides two seasons, uh, the Senators were a hard luck team. I've had the privilege, and I'm sure you have too, having Hank Thomas on the show, who was the grandson of Walter Johnson. And, you know, I always speak with him. If Johnson was on another team besides the Senators, he could have won maybe 600 games. He pitched. But Johnson was, yeah, I mean, Johnson, Johnson was the, was the uh, battling force. Uh, you, you know, Ian, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, Hank Thomas and, and being Walter Johnson's grandson. Uh, w- one of the things about the dominance of Walter Johnson as a, as a major league pitcher, he, in his career, had 110 shutouts. So, I oh. mean, pitching for Washington, wow. where, where they never had a lot of, you know, a lot of power, but they always <clears> depended <throat> on speed and defense and pitching. And, and Walter Johnson really was the epitome of that with the pitching with with over 400 wins and 110 shutouts, which just is, is an incredible number. How many complete games, gentlemen, approximately? Well, I, I don't know. I don't have it in front of me, but it, it was a considerable number. And back then, as Ian will attest, you know, it was a different strategy being used. You were a starting pitcher. You, you pitched complete games. So 
his complete games record is, is uh, uh, phenomenal compared to what happens today when you have a, a pitcher going six innings, a middle reliever, a closer, and that kind of thing. Very few uh, complete games are pitched today. But in Walter Johnson's era and before and, and after, starting pitchers were expected to start and finish ball games. Right. He had 531 complete games. Unbelievable. Holy Toledo. Think yeah, that's an amazing number. <laughs> I that doubt is very seriously if there were 530 complete games, um, I don't know, I, in the last five years of baseball. Um, probably the last 10 years total in baseball. It's very rare. However, da, 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 time out for some accolades to a 44-year-old gentleman who, I don't know if it was a, it was a complete game, if I'm not... It was. It was Friday night. Well, I happened to look it up. <laughs> Friday <now>. night. <laughs> and, and I thought Friday because night. Ronnie was going to be on here, we would talk about Bartolo Colon <laughs> right. with his with his being 44 years old and pitching a complete game. A complete game. Unbelievable. Well, yeah. Uh, especially <laughs> given the year he's had, um, that right. this, is, this is really nice. I think it's going to be his last year. I uh, wanted him so much to break Marichal's record for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that I was an acquaintance of Johnny Roseboro, and I thought that um, their little instance was the by far and away the most embarrassing thing that the giant franchise, either in New York or in San Francisco, experienced. Um, over, over my lifetime of being a Giants fan and then a Giants apologist. So for that reason, it would have been nice. And he had some wonderful experiences with, with my Mets. And um, But got to give him credit, a, co- a complete game at age 44, uh, <laughs> making history as, as it goes uh, for no other reason than um, his age. Um, right. Terrific. Uh, it really is. It really yeah. is. He pitched a champ. Uh, what, uh-huh. what was I going to ask you, um, George? What he, when your dad played? How was the history of Washington celebrated? Were there old timer games like we had grow, growing up in New York? Um, it, our birthright, the World Series. But the Yankees had um, old-timers days that were magnificent on a, on a regular basis. Did the senators of your dad's age pay homage to the senators of that Ian is talking about? Well, I, I'll tell you what, Rob. As far as I know, I, I don't recall old-timers days. I know that my dad uh, attended a couple uh, old-timers games with the Yankees put on because it, one was the 25th reunion of the 1939 All-Star game. They had it at Chase Stadium. And um, and that was uh, interesting for my dad to meet up with a lot of his old friends. But as far as the, the Washington old-timers days, I don't recall any. I just know that the players from the 20s and 30s and during my dad's era, the 40s, they all knew one another. And they were frequent visitors. And a matter of fact, some of the you know, some of the players from the 20s and 30s actually were still with the Washington Ball Club when my dad was playing. So I I think there was a lot of history, and the fact that, uh, you know, Walter Johnson being, you know, legendary as far as his pitching, but also was the Washington announcer in 1939 and did the radio broadcast. So, you know, they had a close, uh, you know, relationship with a lot of the players from the past, uh, with the players that uh, and my dad's teammates with, with Washington. I I got to ask you. We talked in, uh, over these uh, last months about uh, Gwen Verdon and damn Yankees. Right. I never yeah. asked you. Did your dad enjoy damn Yankees? Yeah, he he did. As a matter of fact, and and I uh, two things. One, there's a photograph. It's on the Mickey Vernon website. There's a photograph of Mickey Vernon. Charlie Dressen and Gwen Verdon backstage at uh, at Damn Yankees, the Broadway play. Then in uh, 1955, that summer in Summerstock, there was the Damn Yankees, and uh, Sinjin Turrell was the promoter of the 
Damn Yankees at the Lambertville Music Circus, invited my dad. I happened to go with him. My dad was sitting in the in the audience, and St. St. John Terrell gets up before the show and says, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce a real-life Washington Center, and he brings my dad up, and my dad is, you know, taking pictures with with the cast, and uh, the photographers had, had fun with it, and my mother was not too happy the next day. There's pictures in the paper with my father and, and Lola, and I remember her saying to my my dad, said, George, how could you do that in front of your son? <laughs> so that was my that was my damn Yankee story. But it was uh, it was very fun. I mean, my dad loved it, uh, the show because great music and obviously the connection to Washington baseball. Yeah, and really the music is very underrated. Um, there's one song I love that, that has served me very well. You gotta have heart. Right. You gotta have think heart. about it. Um, that's a, a motivational song. You get up in the morning, you yeah. put that uh you put that on, you go to work, you gotta have heart. Go right. out there. That's right. Um Absolutely. And, Ian, did you like that movie? Oh, I love the Am Yankees. It's I love it, it, just, it it just shows you the sentiment of baseball in the year. Yeah. And you know, right. and since we're talking about the, the Washington Senate, there's two things I wanna point out. Number one, I think if my memory serves me correct and George correct me, in nineteen thirty six the Senators finished second behind the Yankees, um, if I'm not mistaken. I know well, they, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure about 36. They did finish second uh, to the Yankees in 1943. Uh, it was yeah. a distant second. They were 13 and a half games behind. But in 1945, they finished second, just a game and a half behind the Detroit Tigers, who went on to win the, the uh, 46, I mean, the, yeah, 40. Uh, 45 World Series against the Cubs. So, you know, Washington had that, that rap always, you know, first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. But that wasn't always true because they did win the World Series in 24 and in the American League pennant 25 and 33, and then the, the two second-place finishes. So they had some, you know, they had some down years, obviously, but they had some pretty good years as well. And what many people don't know is that your dad was a rookie in 1939. And if I'm not mistaken, when Garrick gave his luckiest man speech, it was right. people had it that day. Your father was there. And yes, he was. He was. He was on the field, Ian, and I have that photograph in my office. Uh, he's standing along the first baseline with the other Washington players when when Lou gave his uh, luckiest man speech. So, you know, that wow. was very meaningful to my father. Hey, and my mother, Vivian, the late Vivian Nis Tikachinsky Tycho, Actually, I should have thrown in a Nishnevitz, Nisnewitz in there somewhere as well, um, was an attendee of that, that baseball game in 1939. She was 19, and my grandfather uh, owned a, a sporting store. Much, It was a general store, but sold a lot of sporting goods, so we have that in common, George Case. Right. I didn't uh, know that, Ralph. Yep. Yeah, in Mount Kisco, New York, up upstate a little bit, and um, my grandfather had some friends in the front office with the Yankees and um, copped some tickets to that game, and um, she told me that story, and I might have repeated th this uh, on the air. I came home from school in 1956 in October, I think it was the 8th or the 6th, probably the 6th, to watch Don Larson's the last few innings huh. of Don Larson's perfect game. Perfect I was 10 game. years old, and yep. uh, naturally my mother was home because uh, she was the stay-at-home mom. And um, we talked about, uh, we watched the final innings, and wow, that was pretty cool. Yogi jumping into Larson's arms, and um, she told me that story, and I... I wasn't a Yankee fan, but I was a Yankee worshiper. Um, you, you had to worship their history all growing up. Um, yeah. And that gave me goosebumps then, gives me goosebumps now. Your dad was there. Um, I mean, I was at a game in Washington with the new senators, and it turns out your dad was coaching back then. Um, so... Um, we shared the same, your dad and I, and probably you, yeah, um, shared a lot of the same air um, along the, 
the days, as baseball fans will do. Um, it brings us all together. It's great. Well, I, I think, watched Ralph, that when, you, when, you're, Ralph. when you're mentioning those things, that, that's really where my interest in, in baseball because of my dad's connection to Washington back from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and uh, you know, all those years. And then when, when he was uh, coaching for the expansion team in 61 to 63, and then when he was – you know, coaching for the Twins in '68. My my connection to Washington baseball goes back a long way, and and as a child, one of my earliest remembrances was my dad talking about being on the field. You know, with Lou Gehrig when he gave his luckiest man speech because the players all loved Lou, and they didn't know what was wrong with him. They didn't know that he had a terminal illness. Uh, he was so gracious when he gave that speech, and that my dad told me many times. He said the players. All the players on both side, on both teams, you know, had tears in their eyes just listening and, and watching Lou, you know, say goodbye to baseball. And yeah, I'm sure his they did. Legs I'm were sure wobbly. Um, yeah, it, it hit him so quickly uh, too. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, within two years, he, he was gone. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, terrible tragedy. And. Yeah, Ironically, terrible. they have not. They have no inroads as to finding uh, a cure. Or, cure, uh, no. Uh, well, we've talked about that before, you know, Ralph, Ronnie, and Ian, and really, you know, when when ALS was was diagnosed with with Lou Gehrig in in '39, and they they called it, you know, it's been known ever since as Lou Gehrig's disease, and there still is not a cure, and and oh. certain you know people. Uh, have the disease. It's a horrible disease. It, it affects a lot of you know people in the in the prime of their life. And as a matter of fact, one of the New York Yankees, uh, you know, the legendary Hall of Fame pitcher Catfish Hunter, died of ALS as well. Hmm. Two th- two things yeah. with that, George. Last week, Sam Shepard, famous playwright, and he played um, Charles uh, Chuck Yeager in The Right Stuff. Right. He died of ALS. Chuck Yeager is still alive at 95 years old. That's the that's the key to this. But um, Catfish Hunter, his legs are wobbly. He didn't die of ALS. He had ALS, and he tripped down the stairs and hit his head, and he couldn't move. Oh that's boy, how, and that's oh. how Catfish. That's how Catfish died. And I, well, you know what? Yeah, Ian, I didn't realize the the details, but but ALS certainly had to be a contributing factor in, oh, in the fact absolutely. that they, you know, they lose the, all, all muscle. The symptoms that made him fall down the stairs. So, right. Yeah, that's what it contributed. Right. Now, I got a question for Ronnie. Ronnie, now, yeah. you you were in Sheboygan, um, right. Wisconsin, in 1961 when the Senators moved to Minnesota and, and they came to Right. Minnesota. Now, you are wedged. The, the, the nearest yeah. two teams between you were Chicago and Detroit. And, of course, right. if we all know you were a big Dodgers fan being Jackie's friends. Did a lot right. of people start moving for the Twins when they moved from Washington? Uh, they did, but there was a lot of people rooting for the Braves, you know, <clears throat> at the time also. So um, they, they did, though. A lot of people from Iowa, for instance, they would uh, – and I got a horse in my throat, but uh, a lot of people from Iowa, for instance, would support the Twins. Uh, and a lot of those people were Cub fans before, um, until the Twins came. But uh, they were very popular, um, and they still are. They're still drawing pretty good. They have a One beautiful of the most consistent now. franchises, if you look at it, I think yep. the Cardinals are right up there. But yep. they have rarely had tr- horrible years, and yep. they always seem to be in contention for long periods of time. So yeah. um, I mean, last year was a horrible year for them. I mean, give they them lost a lot of credit. 100, we, uh, I think last week losses. we paid homage to um, to Rachel Robinson, Jack, yes. um, Jackie's um, late Jackie Robinson's wife, and your friend as well. She went into yes. the Hall of Fame, and a former Washington Senator's Utility outfielder went into the Hall of Fame, Mr. Whitey Herzog, the White Whitey Man. Herzog, right. Uh, one That's of my right. uh, favorite baseball cards, uh, 1958 <laughs> set, um, is a great one. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that 
has a great picture, a great shot of, of Whitey Herzog um, as a senator. Do you remember him, George, as uh, as a senator coming up? Well, you know, I, I remember him being with the ball club, but I don't I don't recall you know any anything about Whitey as a as a player. I mean, he was obviously a great manager going in, and I think he, if he was with the expansion centers, it might have been after my dad. I'm not sure when he was. No, uh, it was the original senator. Was it the original senator? Okay. Yeah. Because he, if he was a utility outfielder, I mean, I, I'm not sure, but you know, the fact is that Washington had some great, you know, teams in those years, and especially with guys like Killebrew and and Allison and Jim Lemon and yeah. Seavers hitting home runs. So there wasn't a lot of a lot of room for you know for players uh, the caliber of say Whitey Herzog, but. But I'm sure I was just going to mention when the when the senators moved to to Minnesota, I'm sure eventually the Minnesota fans became enamored with him because of the great, you know, hitting that they had on those ball clubs, along with yeah. with Oliva and and uh, and Carew and some great pitchers. So you know the Twins had a had a very strong team, and a lot of the people in Washington were were really upset when the when the original senators left to go to Minnesota because they finally had a a team that they could root for and, and put some some people in the stands, and all of a sudden the, the team is gone. Mm-hmm. How did the they, Twins? Again, we've talked about this. It's almost miraculous that um, things were the way they were. Um, team moves, the original team moves to Minnesota, and right away, expansion comes this forced expansion this was before the mets and houston came in in 62 right. this was 61 right and right. um the angels and the new washington senators come to be how did the should have the city gotten eminent domain for the um is there a way if they were going to If they could justify moving and bringing in another team, could the commissioner have gone, wait a minute, stop this. If we're going to have an expansion, why not have an expansion in Minnesota? What, um, and um, force the issue that way. How did it come to, to be? Was Griffith that slick that he could get his way? You know, I can't. I can't answer that. Maybe Ian knows more about it than I do. But I know that that, that my understanding that there was an agreement with Major League Baseball when Calvin said that he was going to move to Minnesota because it was a much better deal for him financially. But he insisted that Major League Baseball would expand into Washington because he did not want, uh, nor did the Commissioner of Baseball want the city of Washington, our nation's capital, without you know a Major League team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the down. Minnesota, tw- the Twins had a tremendous farm system, too. I mean, they kept bringing up tremendous ball players, one after a next or to the next. You know, it was just unbelievable. Well, I was for fortunate enough years. to cover one of their farm teams, the Visalia Oaks, for uh-huh. many years in the 80s and 90s. And uh, they were incredibly um, – they're the ones that sent – Kent Herbeck up to the major leagues, who hit a home run one night in the Cal League, and the next night he hit a home run in Yankee Stadium. He was called up from high A baseball to um, to the majors. That was a darn good ball player for a lot of years. He was great. He was wonderful. Uh, He was excellent. Yeah, yeah, uh, terrific hitter. Yeah, they've and they keep their franchises pretty much uh, their minor league franchises pretty much in tow. So there's not a, not a lot of traveling, moving around, and yeah. um, a lot of loyalty in their minor league system. Um, right. Yeah. You know, it kind of dwindled for a while uh, the last few years, but I think these new guys, the guy from uh, Texas and the other one from Cleveland are bringing it back. But, I mean, my God, when you think about all the players that they brought up, one after another, Rod Carew, Lyman Bostock, uh, there were so many. I, I, I can't even think of them all, you know. But it was well, Lyman just died unbelievable. Early. He died in uh, yes, he did. shooting in, in L.A. That yeah, was a that was unfortunate, yeah. 
Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Tragic story. Um, yeah. Ian, how did the early senators connect from the dead ball era to the live ball era? Well, you know, it, 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 it really, the dead ball era, you know, Washington, you, you had Walter Johnson. And I start with him because, again, he's probably uh, the most well-known. Again, you're talking about a pitcher in his 20s. Now you're talking about two different eras where two different strategies are employed. You're not, you know, you're going from an era where bunting, stealing, uh, not a lot of uh, balls are hit to the outfield because you're using one ball throughout the whole game. I mean, if you hit a foul ball into the stands, they had to throw it back. The damn thing looked like a head of cabbage at the end of the game where it looked like leaves <laughs> falling off. And it was. It was true, yeah. You know, it was a pitcher's, it was a, it was a pitcher's era. It was a pitcher's era where you could spit on the ball, where you could yeah. dirt, dirt into the ball, uh, you know, hair tonic into the ball, crap into the ball if the circus was in town the day before and it crapped all over the field. <laughs> and, you know, think about the poor, I think what the poor catcher had to go through. But now, <laughs> but you know, now you go to the live era uh, right after the Black Sox scandal. And Washington had immediate success going to the World Series in 1924. But the big thing, I think, was uh, I think the big thing was uh, Bucky Harris uh, becoming manager of uh, the Senators and leading them to two, um, you know, two successful seasons. Now, my question to George Case is, why in 1927, after ha- having a nice run, did they replace him with Walter Johnson when he had his first losing season? Yeah, you know what, I, I, and it's interesting, and, and I don't know the reason for it. I know that uh, you know Mr. Griffith was was uh, you know really close to Walter Johnson, and, and, and you know his his thought process during that time. I'm not sure what it was, but but Walter did did take over, and the Senators did have some some bad years, and then Walter went on to manage in Cleveland. Just I think one of those type of players, such a great player, but really not a good. A good manager, and that's always been the case with uh, not always, but but many times, you know, an outstanding player is you know not able to to use that that playing ability when it came to his managerial skills, and I think that might have been what happened there. Now I can't speak for why, you know, Bucky Harris was let go. I mean, Bucky Harris had like I think five different stints as a Washington manager, and. And won, uh, you know, a pennant with the World Series with the Yankees. And my dad played for Bucky and thought he was the best manager in baseball at the time. Uh, but Bucky was uh, known as the Boy Wonder in 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 '24, and in '25 they followed with that success. So I'm not sure why Mr. Griffith made the change. I really don't know. Maybe he felt that that Walter Johnson would would draw a lot of people in. But you know, as it turned out, the Senators uh, went from. Uh, being American League and World Series champs, and then they fell off the face of the earth, basically, when it came to, you know, Major League Baseball the next year. You know, and, and you know, George, and folks, my question is, Bucky Harris, if you look at his record, if you, um, you know, like your dad really had a lot of respect for him, a lot of love, he wins that one championship. Right. New York Yankees. He almost wins the pennant in the 48 race between Cleveland, the Sox, and the Yankees, and he gets let go for Casey Stengel. I consider Bucky a very hard luck kind of uh, manager. And, 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 you know, you you could read all the accounts. He didn't connect to the players. He couldn't handle the Maggio and and all this other stuff. And the players might have had uh, more leeway with him. But the numbers don't lie regarding Bucky Harris. He was a play. He was a player's manager. Well, he was, Ian. As far as my dad was concerned, my dad loved Bucky Harris. He thought he was the best manager in baseball at the time, and uh, we were fortunate. We were invited up to Cooperstown in 1975 when when Bucky was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, his, his son Stanley Harris had to handle the the induction for his father because he was very ill at the time, but. You know, Bucky uh, had great respect amongst the players, and I can't tell you why he was let go. I have absolutely no idea. I just know that when my dad was playing, my dad played for him from 37 to 42. Uh, You know, that was a a, a nice stretch, and and the players really enjoyed playing for Bucky. So what happened, you know, before that and what happened after his success when he went with the Yankees, 
you know, I can't tell you. If, if it would have been if it had been me making the decision, I think I would have gone with a winner. And if he if he won, you know, why make a change? But you know, they did make changes. And as you said, you know, Casey came in, and then he had a long run. So. Uh, you know, Bucky was a terrific manager, and I think that uh, he certainly deserved the uh, Hall of Fame because of what he did, uh, a lifer in baseball and, and well-respected by all the players who played for him. May I elaborate on something you said? Um, you, were, you guys were talking about um, the real superstars in baseball very rarely become successful managers. And kind of the poster boy for that, and I want to get into why, because he, Ted Williams, who managed the expansion senators um, before and after they moved to Texas, was very successful early on and was quite successful, especially in improving batting averages of guys that – just became overachievers under his tutelage. And they did very well. Um, I think he got bored once they moved to Texas, um, but he wasn't all that bad a manager, was he? Uh, I'm asking. Well, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to speak for you know for Ted because I really don't know. But I know that they he had the one good year in '69 when when Washington uh, I think they wound up fourth in the AL East and uh, they had a winning record. And then you know the next couple of years they went down and then Bob Short moved the team to Texas and Ted managed there one year. But then that, that was his fourth year of his fifth year contract and he just said I've had enough. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, it's hard to say. Ted was a great teacher of hitting, and I think he did raise the batting averages of a lot of the players. But on the other hand, I don't think he was really strong in the in the pitching uh, area as far as knowledge. And I know that Sid Hudson, who was a good friend of my dad's, a good friend of our family, uh, had been a Washington player and been with the expansion team and stayed on with, with Ted. Uh, Sid was really given the responsibility of, of handling the pitching staff. So... You know, Ted was a great hitter, a great teacher of hitting, but I'm not sure how much he really was involved in the day-to-day managerial, you know, skills that are required of a major league manager. If you look at a lot of the managers over the years, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, Ralph Houck or, or some of the other ones who, who were great managers but really were not great players. So I think there is a correlation between – you know, being a great manager and being a great player, I don't think it necessarily follows that one is is dependent upon the other. Well, I heard something today that when Lou Boudreau became a player manager, he was only 24 years old. Right. That uh, amazes me. And it, um, he was probably the, um, the backbone of that team as a player. Should a team ever consider hiring uh, one of their own as a manager? For instance, the Mets are looking at David Wright, perhaps, taking over next year. Managers hired to be fired. How is that going to be, be it two years down the road, three years, five years down the road, when they have inevitably have to part ways with the manager? Um I don't think it's a good idea, superstar or not, to have a beloved player be your manager. But um, teams do that to please the fans a lot. I know uh, David Wright's hiring will boost ticket sales, but will it help the franchise in the long run? Um, Can't say. You know, Ralph, you mentioned Lou Boudreau, and I just wanted to, you know, jump in here for a second because Lou Boudreau was the playing manager of the Indians in 46 when my dad played for Cleveland. And and during that era and before, you know, Bucky Harris, when he was with Washington, he was a playing mat player manager. And then in the 30s, uh, Joe Cronin was the player manager. So that was a tendency during uh, the, that era for, for managers to be playing managers. Now, I'm not sure – that that still exists today, and I don't even know who the last playing manager was in Major League Baseball. But but certainly I agree it's it's a problem if you're going to hire a, a great 
you know, player who played with that team, at some point you're going to have to, you know, sever the ties. And that was uh, part of it. As you say, Ralph, uh, a manager is hired to be fired. That's going to happen. And I know that in, in my dad's instance, when, when Mickey Vernon, who was a great player in Washington, and, and in 63 he was fired by George Selkirk, and Gil Hodges was brought in. So, I mean, that's a, that's a fact of life, unfortunately, in, in Major League Baseball, and not only baseball, but, but all the other professional sports as well. And, you know, yeah. speaking of what George said, the last player manager in baseball was Pete Rose um, on the Reds in the 80s. Um, but I'm writing a book right now on the uh, Ty Cobb and uh, Tris Speaker um, affair where they were both banned by baseball by Ban Johnson and the whole thing that it's been sued. They were both player managers at the time in the 1926 season with uh, Cleveland, uh, who uh, was coached by Tris Speaker, who, again, probably the best center fielder of all time. If you, he still leads the league in uh, doubles, if you look at the stats. Um, finished second three and a half games behind the Yankees. He had successful seasons as both a player and a manager, always maintaining a 300 a batting average, whereas Ty Cobb, on the other hand, not so. Um, in the beginning with Ty Cobb, in 1921, when he took over the Detroit Tigers, he was going to have a hands-off approach, uh, more of a you know get along like Bucky Harris. It didn't turn out that way. He became a very, very micromanagement uh, kind of skipper, and uh, by 1926, I mean, the Tigers finished sixth. And a lot of compl- players were complaining uh, that he had become a strict disciplinarian. Uh, so what you do on the field doesn't necessarily mean know what you're going to do as a manager. And like you and George said, you know, you're hired you're to be fired. Right. Um, George, your dad managed. He didn't manage in the bigs, but he did manage at Hawaii, right. which was triple A. What did he like about managing, and what did he not like? Well, he he loved he loved managing uh, young players, and uh, in uh, his assignment in Hawaii for two years was to really develop you know major league ball players for that next or, you know potential major league ball players for that next step. But then uh, later on, he he managed in Oneonta, New York, which is short season A. Uh, New York Penn League, and, and there was a lot of young kids right out of college, their first taste of professional baseball, and my dad loved that. He loved teaching kids about being a you know ball player and, and acting like a ball player and then also living your life, uh, you know, other than being a ball player because my dad used to have a, a thing with kids. He'd say, geez, you have a certain amount of meal money and you wind up going to McDonald's and that's where you eat your breakfast. Well, my dad was a stickler on on diet. He just think that the kids should should eat right. And and uh, the thing that that bothered him about minor league managing the two things: one, Hawaii was there, and it was the road trips. They were, you know, in the air three weeks, and then they'd be home, and then they'd be traveling. That was a problem. And then in Oneonta, when he was older, uh, managing again, loving to manage young kids, but the long bus rides were really taking a toll. So he was there for four years, and and finally said, "That's enough. I, I love the game, but I just can't ride buses anymore." Yeah. Hey, a true baseball lifer. I mean, you come back after a yeah. really solid big league career, and you sacrifice. You're like you said, he was away from the family for like right. weeks at a time. Right. Um, he he right. loved the game. He loved the game, Ralph. And, and for me, growing up, I mean, my dad and I were very close, and my mother did a wonderful job with myself and my sister. But, you know, I was used to when my dad was playing that he'd be away, you know, for six months. We would be living in whatever whatever city where we were, you know, at the time, Washington, Silver Spring, College Park, that kind of thing. But we maintained our home in Pennsylvania. So during the off season, you know, I was fortunate because I had my dad – around for six months of the year, which was really nice because, you know, he didn't right. have to go to work every day. He, he was home uh, being a father to me and a, and a, and a husband to my mother, and, and you know, it was, it was a wonderful life for me growing up as a youngster. Did your sister get into baseball? The, well, she didn't get into it. She was, a, she was a good athlete. She was a good swimmer. The, the one year she went to the University of Hartford uh, up in Connecticut, and I remember she was laughing. She said, well, 
George, uh, George, uh, my uh, our, my baseball coach at, at Hartford, knew of my background, so he asked me to become the manager, the <laughs> the equipment manager of the team. So that was her exposure to, to baseball. She she really left the knowledge of the game to myself and, and my dad. And and you know, as far as the game itself, she always loved it, but she wasn't personally involved in it. Did she run track? No, she didn't run. She well, my my children, grandchildren, they were all natural runners. I, I could run myself, and I guess that was something that we inherited the genetic makeup of my dad. But my sister had had a knee problem, so I think that's why she swam. But you know, she would probably have been a very good runner. I know I used to run. I used to love to do sprints because my dad was a sprinter. But I was certainly not a distance man. I, I just didn't want to run more than a 100-yard dash. That's what I loved doing. Was your dad an Olympic candidate, um, or had he been profession- Had he been a Well, he, I think, Ralph, he could have been. And, Ian, you, you'll remember uh, Shirley Povich. Uh, Shirley Povich uh, covered my dad when he was playing. Shirley Povich covered the Washington Senators, beginning with Walter Johnson. But Shirley told me personally, he said one time that, Hap Hardell, who was the Olympic, uh, I mean, the uh, track coach at Georgetown University, told and uh, saw my dad run and told uh, Shirley Povich, you know, Shirley, if you put a track suit and track spikes on George Case, you'd have an Olympic gold medalist. So, you know, my dad never ran track because he loved baseball, but but he certainly had, you know, world-class speed. Well, he was funny fast. Shirley wasn't he? Povich, uh, um, real quick. I have all of his numbers and emails, and I'm trying to get Maury Povich as a guest on this show. Um, Great. Maury, the famous talk show host, right. must have – he's probably about you, our age, George. Right. He must yes. have memories of uh, that he could share with us. I think he'll make a terrific guest. Yeah, I think yeah. he would, Ralph, and I'm not sure how to get a hold of Mari. I, I think at one time somebody told me that Mari had, had been a bat boy at one point with the Washington Ball Club. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but somebody told me that not too long ago. But, but Well, Charlie I've, got, I've got the numbers in the email. By uh, early next week, I'm going to try to put it together with him. Um, that would be great. That, really that would be great. great. That would be terrific. Um, uh, Ian. Anything else that you consider history, because we're running up against uh, time, anything else that um, in the history of the senators that you could bring out that will enlighten us, that is not common knowledge, that is something that you went, whoa, when you found out about? Well, I think, I think you know, the, the 24 World Series, um, you know, that whole thing, uh, there was a lot of talk of uh, fraud during the World Series, and Landis and uh, Johnson, Van Johnson, um, you know, they were fighting over this, whereby uh, Landis literally said to the uh, American League uh, magnets, either get rid of Van Johnson or just get rid of me. <laughs> and he said that three years later in 27, when Speaker, there was controversy over the 24 uh, World Series. And, um, you know, especially when Harris brought in, I mean, Walter Johnson was around 40 years old. Uh, you know, he brought in Walter Johnson to pit, pitch on just one day rest. <laughs> you know, oh. he, had been, he had been the losing pitcher in game five. And, and what happened was Johnson held the giant scoreless into extra, extra innings on one day rest. <laughs> Right. Well, well, and that was back then in '68. Mickey Lolich comes in, pitches the seventh game of the World Series on two days rest. So yeah. we, we've come to the point now where the, the pitch counts, the um, extended rotations, the specialization of relief pitching. You got a guy coming in the sixth inning, seventh inning, eighth inning. Closer, setup man, lefty specialist, this and that. It's evolved so much. Another guy I have a number of, whose number I have, pitched on the expansion um, senators, and um, his name was Mickey Lovich. 
He won 30 games in 1968 with 300-some-odd innings. How does it get from there to here that quickly? And that's just an open question. Uh, I want to know, there's no definitive answer. What do you think contributed the most to it? We'll start with Ronnie Rabinovitz. I think it was money. I think it's money. That they're kind of babying these uh, pitchers today. Um, and I really think that that's the thing. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't like pitch counts. I think it's a joke. Uh, you actually put them up on the scoreboard now. Uh, oh, he's had a hundred pitches. Or, you know, well, talk to Warren Spahn or, or Don Newcomb or anybody else about pitch counts or Bob Gibson. They laugh in your face. I mean, you pitched until you got knocked out. And that was it. It was a different game then. Now it's oh my God, they can't. He's, he's pitched 103 pitches, and it's you know, it, it's a whole different game now. And I think it has a lot to do with money. You know, Ronnie, I happen to agree with you on the money part of it because the, yeah. the players are getting such uh, huge amounts of money, and the sure. and, and pitchers, you know, they've got to protect those those arms and that uh, multi. But it doesn't seem. But, but the lack of the lack of innings that they're pitching doesn't seem to be working in protecting them. There are more no. injuries than Well, you than know what, ever. there are There right. are a lot of arm injuries that seem to be happening. And, and you know, we've talked before about Tommy John surgery, that, that players right. now, young players, are getting Tommy John surgery before they even need it. And, you know, to me that is just absurd. But, you know, the fact yeah. is that, that players, I mean, the, the older players would tell you, and I know that, that Nolan Ryan, uh, who's always maintained this, that you strengthen your arm by pitching. And uh, right. you know, today you've got pitchers that are going six innings and, and complete games are a thing of the past. And, uh, you know, it's just a different world. But when I'm sure that you mentioned like a like a Bob Gibson or, or when Early Wind was pitching or Warren Spahn, if, if a manager came out to, to take them out of a ball game and said, hey, you know, your pitch counted, you know, which they didn't have back then, but, but they you know, didn't even have many that, right. pitches. You know, they tell they tell the manager, get your rear end back in the dugout. Get I'm going to finish get this game. Back in the dugout. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. It's Who crazy. developed the pitch count? Was it was it um, La Russa? Was it? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Just curious. Anybody, Ian, do you know? I think it might be the uh, Billy Bean. Um, of thought of uh, baseball, uh, the whole uh, okay. yeah. Saban matrix. Because if you were calling the '90s, pitches still went nine innings. So, yeah. You know, if, and look at look at Jim yeah. Mara. Uh, look at uh, you know Morris in the uh, in the '91 World Series with the Twins. He went ten innings. Jack Morris. Right. You know, yeah. so you know. I think what they're trying to do. And again, you know, Morris is an enigma of that era. I think Nolan Ryan was an enigma of that area. But look at Mel Stottlemyre, you know, and Jeff sure. Peterson. Both of their, right. you know, they were great pitchers, but their arms fell off by the time they were 34 and 35. Not to yeah. say that injuries like we, like George and, and Ronnie mentioned, yeah, it's money, and yeah, it hasn't really stopped injuries. But how fast is your fastball going after six innings of pitching? You know, yeah. has a has a team has a team latched on to where you're going to throw a you know, 85 mile an hour slider, you know, and you pitched him two or three times before, so he knows your rhythm now. Bring in the middle yeah. and then release. And when you talk about pitch counts, how many of those pitches were with intensity, with an extra amount of intensity that could, in essence, count for seven pitches? If you think about it, um, so you really—it's really very, very sub, um, subjective about um, determining when a player, when a pitcher should come out, stay in, um, and also pitchers are humans from start to start. Their endurance, their energy changes. Uh, mm-hmm. So. You can't just go by. You got to look the pitcher in the eye and and ask him and and get a feeling for him. Hey, Ian Kahanowitz, you won the trivia contest today. Someone asked, I think it was George, who was the last playing manager, 
And my guess would have been Frank Robinson, who DH'd a little bit um, with Cleveland when he, but you corrected me, and I didn't even say it. I didn't even push the button. I didn't even ring the bell. And yeah. you said D. Rose. Um, somewhere along the line, we've got to do a show about the life and times of P. Rose. <laughs> um, wow, we've got to do a, a week's worth of shows. There will be a lot of controversy about that, I can tell you, Ralph. Yeah, uh, for sure there was. Eclectic, what an eclectic yeah. human being and um, yeah. what a piece of society. I've always said baseball is a microcosm of life, but life is a microcosm of baseball. Um, right. Equally so. You know, so. Sam Ralph. You know, Sam Ralph. With Pete Rose, I mean, and we'll get into it on the show if you want. Yeah, but the, two years ago, ESPN uncovered the hidden um, documents that were by the uh, prosecution. Uh, Dowd from the Dowd report didn't even have this information. Again, in 1989, he protested his innocence, but he accepted a deal because he went to jail. Yeah, the baseball. Now, in 2004, he reversed his his original saying, say, I never gambled. I only gambled on teams that I didn't have to play. This report two years ago, and because I'm doing it on gambling and the Tris Speaker and the Ty Cobb affair, it links it to that back to 1927 because the rules were implemented by Landis after that. And splitting hair saying, well, if you bet on baseball – but you're not playing in the game, you'll be suspended one year. But if you are playing in the game and, and you are betting on your own team, you're going to be suspended for life because now that's either fixed or fraud. And that was the split right. head. And in 2015, ESPN received documents to have it on the Internet saying, uh, yes, ro uh, showing that Rose did bet uh, his receipts on his own team. Mm -hmm. Oh, he bet on his own team, but oh, yeah. and everybody says, or a lot of people say, well, he was betting on his own team. Not only oh. is that a, a false assumption that everything is okay, because when you bet on your own team, how about the days you don't bet? That means you show in the book that he, it's a better chance those days because you don't have money on it. You're not going to use a relief pitcher in the same way. But Peter Golenbach um, told Alan Blumkin and I something that made our jaws drop. It wasn't whether or not Pete Rose bet on his team or the other team. He was betting the over and under. I think about that. Yeah. So it didn't matter. Yeah. He could win the bet, and it didn't matter if his team lost or not. And if it's the over and under, that controls the – for those of you out there who don't know uh, about baseball betting, the over and under is uh, the combined amount of runs that are going to be scored – they'll pick, say, the over and under, they'll they'll pick a seven. And any if they score more, if the combined runs are more than seven, whoever had the over wins. If they're less than seven, whoever had the under wins. But what that's saying is that he could not throw a game, but he could necessarily throw a game, but he could determine the outcome of his bet without it affecting the outcome of his game. And yeah. you say a lot of things about Pete Rose. He's a pathological liar. He's um, a gambling, a sick, uh, ill person yeah, from doing this. You know, it's an illness, gambling. But you're not going to call him not smart. That's the one thing. Right. Undereducated, perhaps, um, a moral degenerate. <laughs> he could, yeah. he could go to that. And there's been some things that came out in the last week or so about his personal life that um, yeah. takes all bets uh, off the table. They're, they're talking about taking his statue down. In um, statue, interesting, some statutory rape accusations came up. They're talking about 
taking his statue down in Cincinnati, let alone building yeah. one in Philadelphia. They were going to honor him in the ring, um, in their ring of heroes or whatever, and they uh, ne- neglected to do that. So all I'm saying, a degenerate man, a sick man, a pathological liar, all those things, but not stupid. He set up, a, he right. set something up where um, he had it going for himself. He, he, not not the brightest in the sense of um, if you're going to take that that course, um, it doesn't often end up well. But um, that's Pete Rose, and we'll have a whole show on him sometime, Ian. And um, but um, we are definitely up against it now. The time, I mean. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I enjoyed, I enjoyed having Thanks, uh, Ian on the show. Oh, yeah. and Ronnie, always good to I talk to you. My biggest fear Thank every you. week is that I shortchange anybody, and if there's anything any of, the, any of you guys want to say, complete your thoughts or anything, Ronnie, anything you want to add? To no, us? I think it was a good show. I was glad to have Ian on it. George, it's always a pleasure. And Ralph, it's always a pleasure. So uh, I wish uh, Chad you. the best of luck. Um Ian, our guest, um, anything you'd like to complete your thoughts with? The only thing, the only thing I have is a question for Ron. And, and we, we spoke about the player manager. Now we know Jackie Robinson retired after the 1956 season, and of course uh, he was traded to the Giants, which devastated him. And he became vice president of the Chuck Full of Nut, uh, Nuts Coffee uh, Company, and later on he'd be, he would active in the civil rights movement and of course he'd be an announcer on ABC's Monday Night uh, Baseball and of course this was all done before I was born in But let me ask you this, Ronnie. In, t- in talking yeah. with Jackie, did he ever have ambitions to manage? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Branch Rickey had once said that he would probably have been the finest manager ever. Um, that's how he felt about him. And he never had the opportunity. There was no, uh, uh, again, it was because he was African-American. They weren't going to put him in as a manager. Um, yeah. But he would have loved it. When Casey was that. managing the Mets so in Epley in 62 yeah. and 63 right. and what have you, he was, a, he was a public figure. He was a, an ambassador. He was great with the writers. He made the Mets. He put them on on the board. But... In, in terms of the product and the field, New York wasn't used to that. They were the lovable Mets, but that right. wore off really quickly with baseball aficionados. We were happy to have yeah. them back, is, um, happy to have a National League team back and all, and it was cute. For, we didn't like losing. And Jackie Robinson had, um, along with Howard Cosell and Ralph Branca, um, pre-game, post-game shows, and they would, Howard and Jackie, bambast, you know, lambast Casey for falling asleep on the bench. Yeah. And Jackie was incredibly bitter that there was no one. I think Ronnie has said his last speech um, was at the Old Timers game, an All-Star game. Um, it was a World, World said, Series in Cincinnati in 1972 on the 25th okay. anniversary of his breaking the color line in baseball. And he said, and thanks he, for this honor, but I won't be happy. I won't right. be happy till I see a black face as a manager in baseball or an African-American general manager uh, at that point. Uh, there was none. And the yeah. first one was, ironically, another Robinson, Frank Robinson. Right, Frank Robinson. Uh, um I'll be happy, like in basketball, Lenny Wilkins, if I'm not mistaken, was the first black coach in um, in the NBA. I don't know who the second was. It might have been Alvin Adels. I don't know who the third, fourth, fifth. I don't know. Sometimes a guy will be a coach, a player. I have a radio thing where I see very few games and I listen to many, many games, I don't know the color of their skin. I can't wait till Mm -hmm. we forget who. Right, right. um, 
what is what is Dave Roberts? What is Jeter? They're the mixed. We're all going to be gray in two hundred years. Right. It's not right. going to be an issue. And until right. it is, until uh, it isn't foremost in, in people's thoughts, and you think things are getting better. I hearken. We talked about this. The um, uh, um, Jones, the kid, or is it Andrew Jones, I think, yeah. center fielder, that had to experience what he experienced in 2018 Boston. in Boston, which yeah. has yeah. always been a, a horrible racial, uh, racially yeah. um, strewn yeah. city. Um, it was horrible. It just horrible. It, it's horrible. It continues to be. But um, step by step, and um, it's going to be better. We gotta, gotta God willing. For that. God willing. You're uh, right. Yes. Um, if she's as magnanimous <laughs> as we hope she is. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that was a, a bit of a thud. Um, you never know. You never know. Never know. You never Thank know. you, gentlemen. Um, we'll be Take back care. same time, same bat channel. Uh, Chad Rubin, please get better soon. We'll um, talk Twins baseball when you return. We'll talk current Twins. Um, it was a good year for them. Am I right, Ronnie? Yes, they're doing very well. No one expected them to do what they've done. Uh, if you remember, they had 102 losses last year. Uh, yeah. A terrible season. And uh, uh, even if they just uh, end up in the middle of the pack, it will have been a successful season for them. Absolutely. Yeah, get some building blocks going and get solid, yep. and uh, yep. that's what we're trying and to I do. I think these two young general manager and his assistant, those two guys are going to turn this thing around. Nice. Yeah, you'll see. They're very sharp. Nice. All right. Well, thank you. All right, guys. everybody. Hang in there. Pleasure. Thank you, George. Thank, thank you, Ron. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, guest Ian yep. Kahanowitz. Um, thank you, guys. We'll be back soon. Thanks, yeah. Adios. Everybody. I enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's Bye-bye. words I like to hear, George. I'd like to hear you enjoying it. <laughs> See ya. Bye.